like now the, the player profiles where you Daniel to be led out on the left, playing, as we mentioned, that Zorak control deck. And look, every single one of those accomplishments listed is champion. Memphis Regionals, champion. Toronto Regionals, champion. Mexico champion and Virginia champion. Yeah, he doesn't do it in halves. He no. goes the whole <laughs> way through the tournament. And uh, that is really impressive stuff from him. Going over a number of years, so consistent at the highest level. And uh, you can see a few of his key components of his deck list. Limitation Sableye could be a really interesting, intricate card that could help him close a game here because the Cephalon does have a two energy retreat cost. So you can sometimes catch those into the active position. Oftentimes the Cephalon aren't playing physical switches. So if he could get into a loop of using Limitation while there's a Cephalon in the active and simply recycle Crushing Hammers and Plumerias throughout the game, that could be a great way that he could trap uh, Zach. So it's got to be something he's got an eye out for. Yeah, definitely a strategy you could uh, keep in mind. Uh, although, of course, as we were discussing earlier, not quite the use for Limitation Sableye that perhaps you would have expected going into today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to try out some Unknown Hand, and I know a few of my friends back home wanted to as yeah. well. Uh, I was trying out a Zoroark and a Ganadel archetype that also used Limitation Sableye to try and deny the opponent. A lot of fun, but not quite as good as Daniel's deck. No, no, obviously, yeah, clearly not. I mean, uh, because we're here behind the casting desk and he's there sitting and ready to play a top eight match. Although, not, not that you're any slouch to, you know, having had success in the past yourself. I mean, Unknown Hand's all about the fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point of it. But Daniel, just like how we found with the Chimeco, that really cute basic tech card, really mm -hmm. changing games, he's found, again, this fairly unused a Sableye card, it, you know, threatened a lot. It threatened to do a lot when it first came out, and a few people sort of were really excited to see it. And uh, finally, he's showing why it's a powerful card. Yeah. Now moving on to Zach Lasage's profile, you can see there, yeah, the key components of his deck as well. The yeah, the Stefan Naganado with his uh, yeah, choice, uh, tech choice of Marsh Shadow, of course, with that great let loose ability. And again, the accomplishments. We mentioned before how long Zach's been playing, and to give you an indication there, 2006 Gym Challenge Champion. I mean, I, I wasn't even, like, Gym Challenges were before I even started playing. Yeah, Gym <laughs> Challenges were before I started playing as well. Yeah. He's, been, he's been doing it for, you know, over a decade yeah. already. And Great experience under his belt. And that experience has been, it serves him very well to lead him here. Also, additionally, a former, as we mentioned, Canadian national champion. And in terms of recent accomplishments, still, like I said, not been able to quite break it into the top uh, eight, but he has had a, a top 16 at the Mexico City Regionals and a top 32 at the Oceania International Championships. So, Blacephalon doing him justice, getting him into this top eight at least. And it's a very powerful archetype. It's going to be interesting to see how he tries to navigate the matchup. It feels like if Daniel is able to get set up, all the questions are being asked of Zach. Yeah. Uh, Daniel will have the answers in hand. And it'll be down to how Zach tries to navigate them. And that is how we're going to see this matchup play out. There is under underneath the watchful gaze of Dustmane Necrozma, these two players <laughs> will uh, battle it out to see who's going to make it into the top four. There's the coin flip, and it looks like Daniel has won that, and we will be choosing to go first. Yep, both players are ready to roll. They're going to draw their uh, seven cards, I believe, and uh, we're going to get this first top eight game underway. So excited for this one. Yeah, so absolutely, same here. Now, what... Yeah, given that Daniel will be going first, that's already a big advantage for him. He'll be able to put up down on the Zoras before uh, really Danny... Before, rather. Danny going first would mean he can get Zoras out before Zach can get out, get out his Naganadals because he'll have to, you know, wait one time with the Poi Poles. But in terms of the prizing, at least, let's see, the counter catcher hitting the prizes, a Lysander Labs, Gladian, one Zora, an Ultra Ball, and a Zorark. So nothing too drastic, I yeah, guess. Yeah, no multiples of cards. No. Uh, the counter catcher could be a big deal. Zach now doing his own prize cards. One choice helmet, one fire energy. You don't mind that. He has a chance of pulling it from a burst GX if he ever chooses to do it. Two, Two Guzmas. Guzma. Yeah. yeah. We mentioned that Daniel's going to be trying to trap him sometimes with big retreat cost Pokemon, essentially anything that's not in a Ganadel. Yeah. And uh, with Zach having two in his prize cards, uh, that could be awkward for him. Very good. We are off, ladies and gentlemen. Top eight. The, the, the Latin American International Championships. Uh, with Danny on the left, Zach on the right, Danny going first, and actually just playing a Cynthia. That is a terrible opener for him. That's that not Professor Elm's lecture. That is de <laughs> definitely not Professor Elm's lecture. Wow. Zero cards played, just that Cynthia, and he's really hoping to find some basics now. Yeah, I really should. Um, just to make a quick uh, clarification as well for you guys, this uh, the top eight card is 75 minutes, not 50, so uh, just to add again, add, uh, we'll get that picked in a moment for you guys. That, uh, but yeah, there's the, they have more time than 50 minutes for top eight. <sighs> he's found himself in a Ranguru. He's got a Professor Elms Letcher for next turn. He's also going to commit a Rainbow Energy to his bench Naranguru, taking that one damage counter and having to pass it over. Not the ideal start for him, but uh, 
Let's see what Zach like, can do. I say not ideal is even a bit generous. That was a horrendous start. <laughs> Literally just one Zora and Oren Guru, but to put a, commit a rainbow to it. Already we're seeing Zach with a better opener, being able to get that ultra space down into play. Gonna allow him to look through his deck, first of all. And also you can see him already eyeing up Poi Pole. Uh, that's gonna be a great card for him to replenish these energies as it is going to be Daniel trying to remove them every turn. Absolutely, and you know, it's funny how you know, just before we started, uh, you know, I was going on about how, oh, you know, Danny's going first, he's going to be able to get his Zoras down, it's going to be a huge advantage for him. But Danny was only able to get one Zora out, so actually, uh, it looks like Zach will probably have the evolution advantage because he's already got two Poipoles down. There's a mysterious treasure, as you said, getting that Poipole. He's also going to be able to go for a Let Loose here. Wow. Trying to steal the game, trying to make it as difficult as possible for Daniel to find an out to Professor Elm's lecture. Yeah. Zach really trying to press the advantage here. Absolutely, and this is a really clever of Zach. He knows that you know he got a little bit lucky with uh, this, uh, with Danny's setup being as uh, lackluster as it was. And he, if he can just try and capitalize on it, make it so that Danny can't draw an out to draw more basics, and then just eventually take some chaos with Blacephalon. Let's see what else he can do. He could end this turn on a first GX, trying to get even more, um, you know prize advantage and also gain, gains him uh, potentially an extra energy on the field. If not, he could go for a slow bursting burn, but it's really all about this let loose to see if Daniel's been affected by it. Indeed. Now there is... Has he done the burst GX already? No, he's no, no. just uh, doing the let loose. Yeah, yeah there he goes. So they've so they drawn it now. And uh, Ooh, okay. Daniel's found himself a Sableye and a Cynthia. It's mm. not Professor Realm. Um, but it's not the end of the world either. The first GX. What do you discard? It's Goose. Be a goose oh, <laughs> man. I like the stylish confidence <laughs> there. It's like, yeah. there it is. It's my <laughs> energy. Oh, that's not my energy. Yeah. And then every canteen at the time it has been fixed. So there we go. These two guys yeah, will have 75 minutes to play at the top eight. We do give players a bit of extra time in the top eight because, you know, because there, there's a lot, lot more. We get to the stage where really I think you deserve the extra time if you make it to the top eight. <laughs> Daniel is uh, debating whether or not to put down the rainbow energy, which he does eventually do. And uh, he's going to play a Cynthia here. He does have a lot of outs to find Z at least one Zoroark this turn. He has the four copies. Obviously, one's prized, actually. But he does have four timeable and Ultra Balls on top of that. So again, it's down to him to reshuffle, find six new ones, look for a Zoroark and hopefully more basics. He could retreat out this turn and even find a Ranguru to resource management back in a couple Cynthias because he's definitely going to need those later down the line. Yeah, he definitely is. It is, it is interesting how he opted not to bench the Sableye. As you mentioned, you did see it in his hand, but perhaps deciding that now's not the best time to bench it. And he does draw a Zoroark. Gets a Zoroark, also gets a Slugma. Here's a Crushing Hammer as well, which could further slow down Zach. Um, that was a Tails, it looks it like. Looks like it was a Tails, as long as it stayed on the table. Yeah. No, okay, oh, no, it, it didn't. flew off the table. It is a Tails, though. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here comes Zerua, Slugma, Zoroark as well in hand. He might want to pay retreat first, though, so he could finish on a resource management. Yep, he's going to try and preserve this Zerua. Actually goes into a Slugma. Ooh. Uses Ultra Space as well to have a look at his own... Uh, deck here. He's also just uh, going to straighten out one of his cards and uh, have a scout through his deck. There's actually no valid target in his deck, but he's still able to uh, shuffle up and see what he needs here. Looks like he does have another one of those Cynthias, so that six cards was incredible for him. Yeah, yeah, the Cynthia pretty much almost as ideal as it could get, all things considered. And yeah, he is going to take a very careful look through to make sure that he knows exactly what he has access to. Just sort of counting things like, yeah, power pads, you can see there the amount of Zorox he has access to, whether he can make use of the Articuno GX. Not that it's necessarily rel as relevant in this matchup, but yeah, just knowing whether it's there or not. Yeah, Daniel's first option to look through his deck. Always integral, especially now that he can see that his Gladian is in the prize cards. It means that, you know, whatever's there stays there until he starts taking prizes. And we know that we never want to take that many against a Blacephalon because B-String is too dangerous for him. Well, uh, no, absolutely. And uh, if you trigger the B-String turn, then and all of a sudden they can just get one billion energies out onto <laughs> their field. It's, it's going to end very bad for you very quickly. One billion energies. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> May as well be. <laughs> Mind blown does so much. It, it just feels like that, yeah. It? yeah. And we do see him pass with that Slugma in the active position. And uh, he's going to find himself once again off the Ultra Space. Looks like he's eyeing up another Poi Pole here. He understands how important it is to get as many Naganadals out as possible. So he, no matter how many energy Daniel ends up discarding, he can just still do all the charging ups in the world. And and really good stuff yeah. from Zach here. He's got two Naganadals down. He's got a Blacephalon now with two energy cards committed to it. Mm -hmm. And um, he's also got a Cynthia to once again refresh his own hand. I'd be interested to see if he even wants to take a knockout this turn. Slugma's such a tempting prize to take away from Daniel because Macargo is so powerful. 
but um, even if he does some charging up, makes it an easy discard, it just puts him in you know an awkward spot if Daniel's ever able to find more Crushing Hammers or Plumeria next turn. Yeah, potentially, but I think that, because he's never gonna, in, in this turn at least, he's not gonna put more than two energy on the Zephalon, he's under two manual attachments, so I think, I don't think you actually lose anything by as long as he can charge up twice, yeah, yeah, it feels no, like a good move. Yeah, it's just if there's enough in his discard pile. That's that's exactly how it's going to play out. And oh, it doesn't look like with his current hand, he actually will be able to charge up twice. Yeah, no discardable cards in his hand. He does not play Sightseer. He just plays Lily. Obviously, he's used the Cynthia this turn. You can see he's being very cautious with his bench. He did Cynthia back in a Blacephalon. That was his other final card in hand. Uh, so he's very aware that um, the bench management is going to be an important thing to do this game. Yeah. And with that, is he going to have to be just content with a with a pa with a bursting, bursting, bursting burn here? Burn. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. Get a nice little twenty damage on the slugma at the very least. He's also going to confuse the target, and uh, that stays means burned. that the tail stays burned. It puts him in a lot easier range for future mind blown attacks. Yeah, it, yeah, it really does. Now, with that, Zach has uh, kind of recognised that taking the KO with the mind blown on the active does not make a whole lot of sense, even though. Actually, if he did it with just the two active, it would kind of make the crushing hammers useless in uh, Danny's hand if he did see them and it would kind of not be able to play Plumeria. But at the same time, it means that, as we already mentioned, with the way Zach's list is built, he would guarantee himself not doing a mind blow next turn. Yeah, so putting the Slugma in range, definitely a better option for him. Now we're going to see finally a Zoroark hits the board for Daniel. A third Cynthia. Those have been the supporters he's done turn one, two, and three. And we'll see what he is able to conjure up with these fresh six and any more trades. As now he finally starts finding Professor Elms. Yeah. They're now great trade bait. He's also drawn into Magcargo, which is a great pickup. Yeah, uh, it's a great pickup. He's, he can evolve that. And of course, evolving does heal all special conditions. So that would get rid of the confusion and the burn, which would uh, put the Magcargo out of range of being KO'd by a one energy, a one energy lost zone mind blown again. So he does already have an Ultra Ball in his hand, so he may already guarantee himself another Zoroark. So he might do his first trade uh, without smoothing over. Uh, but if he's worried about going for or spending too many resources in his hand with the Ultra Ball, he might want to smooth over first, and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, going for the smooth over, deciding yeah, to just go for the Articuno straight away, realizing that it won't really do much good to him in this matchup. So he, if he can just uh, fish it out of the deck with the Zoroark, it's a guaranteed okay card to get rid of with Ultra Ball. As you can see, Daniel just announcing that he's used Smooth Over, and uh, it looked to be the Articuno, uh, which is definitely an interesting card for this matchup. As, you, as we've already said, the Cephalon only able to attach one energy per turn to itself, so if you do this Articuno GX attack, you make it so that you can never really get a big mind blown off as long as you're able to remove one a turn. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just that thing of it being able to use it at the right time because and then because the Blacephalon player can try to almost like, time the mind blown in a way where they lost any energy off the active and then you know, the isn't doing much. So potentially good at the right time, but it has to be used cleverly, obviously. Danny going to use that trade, gets himself uh, uh, enough fodder for another Ultra Ball if he wishes, yep. as well as the card that he put to the top which with was, his smooth over. Which was the Articuno, I believe. Yeah, they, they, you can see it there in his hand. It's the, the one nice rainbow shiny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stands out on the field. It's got that cold crush GX attack. Um, it's something that he wants to access, but it does require. Um, here we go. He's going to put it into the active here. Oh, so he actually is just going to go for it here. And of course, with the legendary scent ability, he can move the energy off the Orange Guru. And uh, here I was thinking he'd just you know, get rid of it with an Ultra Ball. No, actually, he just does opt to go for the cold crush straight away. Very, very cool move here. Mm -hmm. Removes two energy from the Cephalon. Obviously, going into the discard pile can be recharged. Uh, with those Naganadals in the back. But as we're saying, as long as Daniel's able to keep up with crushing cover pressure, the Cephalon's not really ever going to get into a good mind blown range here. So Zach's going to have to find another way around this. He will. He does have that beast energy in his hand, which he could attach. Uh, but obviously, if he does that, then that's very, that could fall victim to an enhanced number very easily. So he's probably going to be a bit wary about doing that necessarily. He's. Uh, might try and you know, feed prizes to Daniel in a way where he's forced to take a knockout and then B-String could be live, but D Daniel will know that Zach's trying to do that, so he's going to try and avoid that at all costs if possible and just try to win, like you mentioned before, you, more by denying resources rather than by taking prizes. So Zach is going to start off his turn with that Ultra Space, so efficient at getting so many of these Ultra Beasts that his deck is full of uh, out so that he can maybe use them later down the line or for just extra thinning. He is holding on to an Ultra Ball. If he has his Tapu Lele available, he may be even trying to go for like a charging up 
turning point knockout at some point. It's just uh, going to be a slower turn for him no matter what. He's actually going to put down another poi pole. Wow. Once all four Naganadal in play this <laughs> game. That's going to be pretty cool to see. There is what looks to be... Is that trying to reach for some damage counters, perhaps thinking he's going to just go for the Bursting Burn straight away. Yeah, it looks like Fire Engine on the active. Bursting Burn is probably the best thing he can do here. Is he choosing not to do any charging up either? That's an interesting call. He's probably he's probably thinking maybe he wants to leave the energy on there for when he actually needs to do them, but or maybe he just... The thing is, if he uses like a char one charging up this turn, even just one, it could set up an Aganadel for future Guzma plays. We know that the Magtargo is now in range with that 20 damage earlier from a burn. It's very true. We know that Ranguru is in range with the beast energy that's in his, in his hand. And both those Aruas are looking pretty tasty. So uh, that's definitely something he's got to bear in mind here. Yeah, it's um, especially like I believe you mentioned with the Magtargo having 20 damage on it. It's, it's in range of uh, the turning point KO, even if, he, even if it's not a turn where turning point does 160 instead of 80. Yeah, so over to Daniel now. What can he do? Currently only one Zoroark uh, on the field. That's got to be his mission this turn, as well as trying to remove the energy that um, was put onto the Blacephalon. I mean, Daniel does have an... Oh, boy. Oh. He's going to hit the beast energy. That's huge. Oh, wow. Give me that beast energy. Get straight into the lost zone. <laughs> That's going to be a big deal. It means that the turning point is never going to be able to do 110, so that Aranguru now feels safe, which is a big deal for him as well as just you know an extra energy out of the way. He can also scout exactly what um, Zach's playing with, which is currently just a Lily. Yeah, a Lily, a Blacephalon, and what looks to be an Ultra Ball. And uh, oh, is that an Naganadel in his hand as well? Yeah, it's the Naganadel that he searched out with Ultra Space last yeah. turn. He wants to get all four out like an absolute champion. <laughs> Daniel eyeing up an Ultra Ball here, getting rid of that limitation Sableye, finding himself another Zorark, as we've already mentioned. That's got to be what he's looking for here. Smoothing over for a counter catcher as well. Yeah. I think, it, should we just draw attention to a second as well, uh, how fast Daniel's moving through his cards. I don't think I've ever seen someone shuffle that fast. Honestly, it's so interesting because he plays an archetype that likes to slowly control the game and get yourself into a better and better position, but he has always played at 100 miles an hour. I remember being so surprised by seeing it at the EUIC uh, the first time we actually featured him. And uh, it's just the case here where his brain is working 10 steps ahead. So he's already making actions and he's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, over the course of a 14-round you know, tournament where every single round is best of 50, best of three 50-minute Swiss, where you don't really have time to complete three full games usually, that's going to be an invaluable asset. Counter catch was an interesting choice. It's almost as if he's hit a crushing cover on a Blacephalon because it's forcing... Zach to find either a switch card or just a physical energy to pay retreat. So it's a really good call from him. And as we say, Zach just working with this one Lily. He's got the Ultra Ball in hand. He's going to use an Ultra Space first. Maybe he could thin a Blacephalon. Uh, as we already know, he's pretty much set his stall out with four Naganadals on his board. He knows that he doesn't want to use multiple Blacephalon here. So uh, he's instead just going to Ultra Ball these away so he can get a full six cards from this Lily. Yeah, he knows that if Danny at any point does decide to KO a Blacephalon, then all Zach needs to do is uh, bench another Blacephalon and, and <laughs> activate all the V-strings that he has access to, and just he can just re kind of still control the game from there regardless. So what are these six cards going to bring Zach? He needs to start powering up this Blacephalon as best he can. And, uh, I mean, the board state for Daniel is getting way stronger now, and his early game that was really so awkward has now sort of vanished. It really has, so we were able to get all the set of all the Zoroks he could ever really want. And off the uh, drawing fairly decently, he has found himself another f fire energy. He can attach that to the Blacephalon, find himself a mysterious treasure too. Any problem really being that he can't exactly easily get this Blacephalon to deactivate, to not draw into any switching cards or anything like that. Yeah, just the manual attachment. It's what he needs. He needs Daniel to be in so, sort of spots where he has to keep playing Plumeria, has to keep cycling Plumeria, has to flip heads on his crushing hammers. That's the pressure that Zach's going to try and put him on every turn. And uh, meanwhile, going back to Danny's side of play, there is a timer ball. Does hit one out of two heads on that, and out comes the third Zoroark. So there is pretty much fully set up board for Danny at this point. He's got to be pretty happy about that setup. Phenomenal board state here. He's also going to, it looks like, smooth over a Cynthia to the top to give him as many cards as possible this turn. Yeah, that is, that is, is that four Cynthia's in a row now? Yeah, yeah. he just loves using that Cynthia. It's yeah. such a solid card for this archetype. He's got Power Pad to recycle them as well if he needs to. 
We are going to see that trade. Gets him a Cynthia. And uh, he's going to go for this refresh. Still tr uh, two trades to go. Uh, he might want to start moving this Articuno out of the active if he's able to find a double colorless. Start using that resource management. Yeah, and uh, as you of course have noticed that, that uh, Articuno not taking any burn damage currently. Of course, he did manage to flip heads on burn so after the first one. So just really the confusion to deal with. But he's not going to be attacking again There's with that Articuno one crushing anyway. hammer. Ooh. Two more trades. Can he get any more of those? And if he only just has the one, can he get heads on it? Can also use a timer ball here. Trying to further thin his deck if he can flip one heads. He gets double tails, which is a little bit awkward for him, so no extra thinning. Uh, he does play two copies of Plumeria. He might have to get rid of one, but they are so such valuable cards. His hand is so powerful. That, oh, he gets another Crushing Hammer. Yeah, that was a very worthwhile uh, Plumeria in that case. So there's Crushing Hammer number one. That is a Tails. <laughs> Good number thing two. he's traded into another one. <laughs> is that a Tails as well? Ooh. It was. Wow, that's unfortunate. He does have a switch, though, so he can replenish these. Yeah. This is 100% the strategy he's going to go for. He's not wasting any time with that. Back they go into the deck alongside what looks to be a rainbow energy. Yeah, uh, the deck plays a very finite number of energy cards, so keeping a tally of those is going to be important throughout the game. Uh, as we see Daniel immediately go for those crushing hammers. He's having to get through so many of them. Uh, so many energy cards <laughs> that the Blacephalon player does use. And uh, he's also eyeing up that counter catcher. Once again, it's almost like you're flipping heads on a Crushing Hammer, as we keep mentioning, as long as uh, Zach's not playing a Guzma. So um, that's why we see the resource management here. Yes, so absolutely, we do. So the two Crushing Hammers and the Rainbow Energy going back into the deck. And now back to Zach as he starts off by just by firing off his Ultra Space again. He can use that to find the one Blacephalon left in his deck. Yeah, they're not too useful, uh, apart from the one that he's going to try and use to carry him through the game. Uh, he wants to just thin those so he can draw into the better cards uh, as these game, as this game is going to go long, let's yes. face it. Um, yes, it definitely that's is. That's just the method that Daniel has to win the game. You can see Zach's deck is already pretty thin here. It's just full of energy cards, but it's whether or not Daniel can go through them. And look at this, already counting how many cards are in Zach's deck, keeping track already. Absolutely. There is the Heat Factory Prism Star from Zach there as well. We're debating whether it was worth playing or not. Decide it is. And of course, with the fire engine in his hand, he can make use of it straight away, discard the fire energy, draw three cards. And if he can discard enough fire energy here, he could put himself in a pretty good way to actually KO the Zorok with a Guzma. I'm really surprised that we saw the, uh, the use of Heat Factory Prism Star voluntarily putting energy into the discard pile. It does make Daniel's sort of loop that much easier. It's one less energy that he physically has to go through. Uh, we're also going to see the Sophocles here discarding a B-string and an Ultra Ball. Sophocles is going to grab him four fresh cards here. Yeah, and uh, I think there's a consideration there as to whether... I think Daniel was, just wor Daniel was just worried that he used a, su used a supporter, but so far it's just been Ultra Space and Heat Factory Prism Star. Oh, right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. He so has drawn into another energy card, and as we've said, he's going to overload this Blacephalon and hope that he can spam Mind Blown a few times here. Yeah, and he has got two Fire Engines in the discard as well, so there's one charging up. He's going to leave it at that for now. And then he's just going to pass. Yeah, patient play from Zach. I really do like it. He needs to make every mind blown attack count here if he's going to win the game. And he used to ideally do mind blown whilst at the same time you know, getting the KO with just by losing energy on his bench mm -hmm. and having leaving enough energy himself onto the active so that if Danny does draw into all of his crushing hammers, then he can still survive two heads and then attach manually to do mind blown again. And we know Daniel is holding on to at least one Plumeria. Uh, so he's going to use that first trade after smoothing over. Puts a Crushing Hammer immediately back to the top. Also gets into an Energy card. Um, he's eyeing up the Lysander Labs. He actually doesn't need it this game because uh, Zach is playing Choice Helmets rather than Choice Bands. So the damage output is not something he needs to deny. And here we see the start of the Crushing Hammer Onslaught. That is another Tails. Oh, no, it is a Heads. He's going to take one away from the three Energy Blacephalon. That's he can Plumeria in addition to this. So, so this is what you're saying. Two energy discards he can just about survive. It's if Danny can find another energy discard out of this, leaving the Blacephalon with nothing on. That's when he needs to worry. Yeah, just checking all the outs here, seeing how many cards are in Zach's hand, uh, whether it's worth using a Skullgrain instead. But I think the guaranteed discard here, leaving this one retreat cost Marshadow on the board to be enough to slow down 
uh, Zach here because it just means that he can resource management back that plume area and the crushing hammer all over again if he needs to. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're going to see to round out his turn here. Yeah, so uh, resource management gets back the crushing hammer that was just played and also the, the plume area, like you mentioned, and a max potion as well. If you can find that max potion and heal off the Zoroark, that would mean that he that Zach would need a five energy mind blown to KO it instead of four. Yeah. Which is a huge difference. Yeah, it's a really huge difference. One more energy card for him to commit. Even that mag cargo then becomes out of range of a turning point attack as well. So he's actually debating it. It will be good at some point. And yeah, he decides now's the time where I want that option to have it. Yeah, he does. So with that, oh, he's he, oh <laughs> maybe not. He's not sure about it. He wants to. Uh, uh, he's going to grab the switch. That's also a good utility card to get back into the deck. Yeah, just uh, in case Zach goes for a Guzma but doesn't actually have the KO. He just you know, goes for it for the sake of trying to buy himself a few more turns. Zach with a large hand size here, just one energy. He's going to use that Heat Factory once again. Does draw into another energy card. Doesn't look like he's got himself a Guzma. No space to play the Tapu Lele either. No, that's a very unfortunate for him. Just uh, Sophocles and Cynthia's, it looks like. It's a Mysterious Treasure too, which could, again, normally find him Tapu Lele, but not when the bench is full. Yeah, we're going to see Sophocles getting rid of those two Mysterious Treasures. No valid targets in his deck to use with them, as we're going to see him continue to draw energy cards. That's actually pretty awkward for him if Daniel's ever got the option to uh, go for a Team Skull Grunt, but it does mean he can continue this attaching pressure. He's really having to um, be patient here. As you said, lots of energies in the discard pile now. He can continue to charge up. He's only doing it very cautiously, which I'm uh, a big fan of here. There's no, like, because he has four in play, he can always put them all in whenever he needs to. Yeah, he absolutely can. And because Danny did not put back the Max Potion with the resource management, he does have another turn to find himself a Guzma potentially with that Heat Factory Prism Star staying where it is. In interesting how Danny actually didn't opt to play the Lysander Labs. Because although, like you said, the, perhaps the damage reduction won't matter too much, just replacing the draw power that Zach has, even if it does uh, mean that Zach decks out more quickly, it, it's still more means of finding uh, for Zach to find KOs with. I think it was one of those moments where he just had such a powerful hand. Nothing, it was like the best of a bad bunch. Like yeah. we've just seen, he just traded away a Ditto Prism Star, a fantastic card. Yeah. It's just that he doesn't need it right now. He's in his loop, so he can just continue to trade, thin his deck until it's literally just in range of resource managementing. And uh, we're going to see him count his own deck as well. He's keeping track of both of players' decks at this point. You've already seen him use one Crushing Hammer. He can continue to push the advantage. He's actually just going to Plumeri away Crushing Hammer, and it could be Enhanced Hammer as well. That's definitely something he can throw away at this point. Yeah, that, that is super, super strong. That is exactly puts Zach in the really suboptimal situation. Such a big deal here, Zach. Been trying so hard, turn by turn, just guaranteeing an attachment. But because of all these Crushing Hammers, in addition to a guaranteed Plumeria hit, it just takes a moment like this for Daniel to ruin those plans. Yeah, absolutely. Could not have said it better myself. There's another Heat Factory Prism Star. So he's drawing another fire energy. And is that finally a Guzma? Oh, no, it's not even another Guzma. It's wow. The two Guzma in his prize cards has been absolutely abysmal. Yeah. Uh, there's actually one at the bottom of his deck. So I think he only plays three copies of Guzma. So at some point, he's going to have to deal with this Mars Shadow and move it out of the way. Yeah. In fact, as you can see yeah, it. He's scooped. Uh, wow. Danny takes game one. And uh, Zach, with those two Guzma prize, not able to find any of them and really needing them to swing the tempo in his favor in the match, but just not able to finish the job. Oh, it was such a awkward scenario. The Marsh had looked such, such a nailed on decision because it could have just meant that he could have dealt with one Zerua and meant that Daniel never got into any Zoroarks and never got that ideal board state going. But just putting down one Pokemon that can't use charging up to retreat every turn meant that that was enough for Daniel to counter catcher up, stall out for the entire game, whilst also replenishing these crushing and enhanced, ha or sorry, crushing hammers and plumeria every single turn. That was, uh, that was brutal. Yeah, it was brutal. And like you said, it is an awkward one because it's not as if benching the Marsh Shadow it, it was you know, bad at the time. You know, he needed the extra draws. He wanted yeah. to disrupt uh, Danny and what he could do, but it just then became a liability that he couldn't deal with. And it's got to be a really awkward feeling as well because he may have thought, man, that was my chance. Daniel drew so badly in those first two turns exactly. and I still couldn't close the win. So he's going to be thinking about that, definitely going into game two and thinking, 
I hope that Danny gets another slow start again, or if he doesn't get a slow start, maybe I can try to avoid benching Marshadow unless I absolutely have to, because I don't want to lose the same way I did just then. And for Daniel, he knows exactly what his game plan is. If he thinks, you know, if he can win in that sort of dire straits of the opening hand, he's got to feel confident about closing this series. Yeah, because uh, he realizes even, even with such a slow start like that, he was still able to win fairly convincingly. And this is the strength of the Zorak control deck. When you're playing that many... Oh, looks like we have a broken sleeve issue. <laughs> Just uh, get, that, get that replaced very quickly, I'm sure. Let's hope that uh, there are some spares lying around. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just going to double check now just to make sure none of the rest of them are broken. The frustrated mash shuffle. Yes. <laughs> Zach was doing after losing that first game. The good thing is he does have the benefit of time. Yeah, you he mentioned does. 75 minutes is the clock, so conceding early, whereas so often we see players just sort of you know, get themselves in worse and worse positions and carry on until, you know, it's a slow death with lots of different resource managements over and over again and manual attachments over and over again. Zach saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, and, he did. Uh, he's given himself the most time to try and react to a second game here and hopefully get into a third one. Yeah, so we can see there the judge there replacing the card. Uh, there were needed spares for the sleeves, so I go back into the deck we go and it's all good, ladies and gentlemen. So once again, it's going to be down to Zach leading the charge, hoping to get, uh, maybe even not even putting down any of the Cephalons in the opening stages, just trying to lead a Poi Bowl here, just do some charging ups. Like we said, if we if he's using Turning Point to date knockouts on things like these Slugmas, Zeruas, and putting pressure on Orangru, that's going to be a completely different tale because Daniel can't just sit back and Plumeria every turn because that's doing nothing. No, no, exactly. That's uh, you really don't want Plumeria to be doing nothing in that instance. There's, I mean, kind of the Danny here just needs to play out the match the same way he has done in game one, and he's going to be pretty comfortable letting win game two and take the series in advance of top four. Zach here checking out his opening hand, as is Daniel, and it's going to be important if he actually doesn't lead his usual ideal starter of the Cephalon. He's got the choice here. He's got Poi Paul, and he's got the Cephalon, and he's actually led the Cephalon all over again. He could fall into the same trap here. He could, but at the same time, I don't think it's quite the same trap in the sense that the Marsh Shadow is, because unlike the mm -hmm. Marsh Shadow, you don't mind attaching energy to the Blacephalon. You know, you want to, because you do need to attack with it at some point. I think it's going to mainly come down to, does he prize two Guzma again? And no, those prizes look a lot better, unless these two end up being Guzma. Ooh, no, that's boy. fine. Also an energy in a really good position for him. It might be the one that he uses on Burst GX. There's yes. a Choice Helmet in there as well, two Blacephalon, which he kept searching out with Ultra Space just to thin them from the deck, so those are ideal prize cards. Yeah, and he's already got the one Blacephalon he needs out, so yeah, he's got to be pretty happy about that. Straight away starting with an Ultra Ball, discarding two Fire Energy, got to be happy about that. And you now going to look through, we're going to see what he has prize and think, yeah, this is very manageable. And he just goes to the Marsh Shadow straight away. Man, he's thinking, oh boy, I've got to try and beat Daniel two times over. And yeah. he is a slow deck. I've got to try and steal a win from the off here and jump into a game three. Yeah, that's, uh, can't fault the logic there, to be honest. Uh, Marsh Shadow goes straight into the hand. This like he's got a Poi Poi ready to go too. So yeah, Poi Poi benched, attached to her fire, let loose. Letting loose indeed, and, and he's saying, oh man, wow. look how broken this hand was. <laughs> it's gone, Daniel, it's gone. It's gone. Four <laughs> random ones for you, buddy. You can see the, ge the gesture there. Daniel <laughs> knew how busted that hand was, and he is not gonna be happy about seeing that get shuffled away. Oh boy, he got out of one let loose. He was able to find Cynthia in uh, the first game, is he going to be able to dodge another bullet here? That's going to be the question here, and uh, it's going to be a really important one as well, because if Danny doesn't, you know, does only draw non-basics and no non-draw spotters off of this, then there's the potential for Zach to just, like you say, steal a quick win, attach one more energy, mind blown, and move us on to a game three. Courageous play from Zach here, and you can see Daniel shuffling intensely here. Yeah. He knows how big of a deal these next four cards are going to be. Yeah, and sometimes you need to take the risks. I mean, you're in the top eight and against an, what it's kind of been proven to be a not very favorable matchup. Like, if you don't take this risk here, then really... Oh, he's got Ultra Ball, he's got Elm. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, oh, oh, dear, oh, dear. dear. Yeah, well. sorry, Zach, today's not your day. Wow, Zach still choosing to hold B-String in his hand. I mean, you've got to think that... Daniel's never going to let you use those. They feel like the easiest burns rather than physical energy cards. Yeah. He is going to find himself the Poi Pole and simply recycle his hand with a Cynthia. He did well off his own let loose, at least. Yeah, yeah, he did very much so. Able to get out all the Poi Poles he needs. But now, with that Marshadow down, the, the liability is just there all over again. And 
I mean, as soon as Zach sees that um, Elm get played, his, his face is probably just going to drop. Yeah, he's going to be a little bit sad about that. Uh, he did actually draw into two Professor Elms, as well as an Ultra Ball. He had all the outs necessary yeah. to get his ideal start here. So uh, we are going to see what else he can get from the Cynthia. Is he going to try and get a Poi Pole army down like he did in that first game? Most likely. Yeah, because uh, if he can get to the point where that becomes more effective, then it's absolutely right for you to go for. He could do four charging ups in one turn. That's going to be exactly what he needs to get the big KOs on stuff. It's uh, just really only going to be if uh, the Marsh Shadow becomes a liability again, where that you know might end up not being so great. So fresh six cards for Zach. He's already got his manual attachment. He's going to do a quick cut. And uh, let's see what he can get, if there's going to be any Ultra Space shenanigans, any more Poi Poles hitting the board. There is one of them. He's also got Sophocles in his hand for next turn and plenty of fire energy, so he's got to pass it over. Yeah, a good start, but still... Oh, my still goodness, he's even got Crushing Hammer on top oh of all this. Oh, my goodness. If he's able to flip heads on this Crushing Hammer, man, I mean, it's just a real sad point for Zach. Yeah, there it is. Oh, it's gone flying. It's the tails. The tails. That's at least something. Yeah. He's going to be able to bench a Zerua, get himself a Presser Realm. Here comes the army of Zerua, Slugma, and uh, potentially even Ditto yeah. if he wants to. Yeah, I just had to look over to where they're sitting, and Zach was literally just shaking his head right there. Like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you got it, huh? Yeah. Well, well played. Yeah. <laughs> well played indeed. Wow. Um, Elm's Lecture showing its power as ever, getting. Three, oh, two more Zoras and uh, Ditto <laughs> to me for good measure. All those mass shuffles, and then Daniel's like, oh, yeah, I need to look what's, his, what's <laughs> in my deck. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, still got that Ultra Ball for the following turn if he needs to wonder tag into his favorite supporter, Cynthia. And uh, that's looking pretty good for him. Yes, it is looking very, very good for him. Here comes, I mean, he doesn't really need to do anything else at this point. He's got literally all of his Zora is out and a ditto. He just kind of is happy to pass the turn here. Now back to Zach. You'd never have known that he'd just got let loose to, to four random cards. No. But, uh, yeah, back over to Zach's turn. He can get manual attachments down. He has a Sophocles as well. He's going to continue to get rid of some of these fire energy cards. Finally dumping a beast ring as well. Yeah, recognizing he's probably going to be unlikely to be able to use it. And now the ideal thing for him here would be to either maybe if you can find a beast energy, or find enough ways to get two Naganadles out and then as well as a fire to hand, then you know, maybe get any KO on the Zora whilst at the same time, you know, not having to get rid of any energy of the active would be the optimal way to go about things. That's exactly what the Sophocles has brought him. One Naganadel, one Ultra Space, so he's gonna be able to get two charging ups going. He can also manually attach to the active, and you've got to think he'll take a prize on this Zorua, yeah. removing two fire energies from the bench Pokemon. Yeah, definitely. We we saw him discard a Fire Engine earlier off. I believe it was a Mysterious Treasure and one off the Sophocles just there, and he has the Fire in hand. So yeah, like you said, he's got all the pieces he needs to take the ideal uh, KO here. Yep, he's lined up. He's ready to take a prize. It also means that uh, he threatens once again, Daniel, to get lots of Zorox. That's step two. Yes, you got the Elm. How well can you do on the next phase? How how well can you transition from these Zoroas into an army of Zoroaks? Yeah. Okay, he's got more than he's actually got way more than I realized. Oh, he's yeah. got like four energy in the discard pile. So yeah, two charging ups, one fire energy on the active, and then I can only imagine a mind blown. Or oh, actually, no, he's going to go for the burst GX first. He's going to go for burst GX first. Gets rid of a Blacephalon. Oh, the, the, the two at the bottom. They, you picked the wrong one. Daniel able to find a Zorak from his top deck, which lets him trade into another Ultra Ball. So he could get a Tapu Lele uh, as well as that. He's actually drawn to the Magcargo. <laughs> It's an awkward discard for him, but he's got to accept it so he can go for that wonder tag, get yep. himself a Cynthia, and he's starting to motor through his deck all over again. Yeah, it's like a repeat of game one pretty much all over, and really amazing board setup. There's, there is there is an actual possibility of him getting almost... You know, he can't get out all of his Zorax, can he? Because he's prized one of them, I believe, but he can still get three Zorax out and start doing lots of trades. And he doesn't want to evolve the active. That's no, the no. one that he won't evolve. He's got to force... Uh, Guzma plays because there's a lot of energies on this board. We are going to see Timer Ball gets her heads. So that's Zorak number two hits the field. And it's down to him to again start digging, start trying to find those crushing in, uh, sorry, crushing hammers and plumerias to limit the amount of energy on this board because Zach's really representing a lot of damage now. Really, he really is. There's a, an enhanced hammer being traded away, only really going to be useful for B string, and there's enough easy ways to get rid of that <laughs> anyway that <laughs> I'm sure he's happy to get to discard the enhanced hammer at this point. He's he's Counter -catcher. Counter catcher, yeah, we saw him use it effectively last time, and there's a Marshadow once again on the bench. 
The one problem being Daniel hasn't drawn much stuff to discard energy, so all Zach would need is one fire energy to retreat the Marsh Shadow in this instance, unlike previously where he needed to both retreat the Marsh Shadow and attach. The only other thing about this is that he knows that um, the worst case scenario is that uh, Zach already is wanting to use a Guzma. Yeah. And uh, already just feeding him the counter catcher just makes the Guzma look all that much better. Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit awkward for him, but he's just trying to, you know, with just a four card hand, he's making Zach have the outs. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, uh, like you said earlier, sort of asking the questions and sort of trying to work out if Zach has the answers because he knows that for his deck, he's more than likely to have the answers, whereas for Zach's deck, finding the answers becomes a bit trickier. So Daniel having a cheeky little scout there to see if the Articuno GX is in his deck, I think. And uh, he's just going to pass it over to Zach, who can finally get a big Guzma Mind Blow knockout if he wants to. He could alternatively go for a um, Naganadel knockout in combination with charging up and attach and take out one of these Dittos or Zeruas. He's got options here. Yeah, he really does. And uh, equally, the one unfortunate thing for him is that I, he won't really be able to take a knockout on the Zoroark without getting rid of one of the engines from the active or... Actually, no, that's not necessarily true. You could do two charging ups and then yeah. get rid of energy from sand. And oh, he's just found a third Naganadal, so actually, though, because ignore me completely, he can <laughs> very much, as long as he gets one more energy and discard, which he's definitely going to do because he has the mysterious treasure in his hand. Depends he how aggressive he wants to be. Does he want to take a cheeky prize on a ditto, not committing too much with these Naganadals, or does he want to go and start using Mind Blown, stopping Daniel drawing a ridiculous amount of cards every turn? It looks like he wants to stop Daniel drawing a ridiculous amount of cards every turn. <laughs> Yep, Guzma. Oh, oh going no, for the ditto. No, you're you're right. Uh, he does want to just go for the easier prize there. Free energy on the active as well is fantastic. That means Daniel's going to have to work extra hard to find more crushing hammer as well as Plumeria to get the job done, and that is a mind blown for a single prize. The awkward thing about the mind blown, rather than going for a charge, sorry, a turning point, is now that Daniel can do that Articuno play all over again. Yes, he can. Uh, and I'm if sure it was the Naganadel, he could have just used Charging Up and paid Retreat back out and still had the threat of Mind Blown. So that's a little thing that sort of slipped his mind there, and it could be really punishing as long as uh, Daniel can trade into the outs to get an Articuno rolling. Yeah, he doesn't have it in his hand as of yet. He has a Cynthia he used to dig for it. He has got another, or he's got a Crushing Hammer and a Counter Catcher, as well as a Team Skull Grunt and a couple of Double Colorless Energies, and a Plumeria, actually. Definitely some interesting outs. He's got that strange decision because he has two more Zeruas on his board. He may want to just recycle with Cynthia to have a better chance of getting the whole combination with Articuno. Um, or he doesn't know whether just to go, hey, can I try and Plumerian trade and get something else? It's a real delicate act here. He's actually going to trade away the team Skullgrunt first. Draws into Timeable Zoroark. Wow. That's going to help. An amazing find for Daniel off of that trade. Has, uh, He's already flipped one hand on the timer ball, and it gets tails there, but one is all he needs. Because he need. he's got the, the fourth Zorak in his hand already, so no, I was wrong, it wasn't prized. That must have been game one. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, four Zoroaks hitting the board, more trades for Daniel. Can he find himself that Articuno rainbow combo? He has none of those pieces at the moment. Failing that, uh, he still has plenty of options. He's holding on to that plume area. He could even draw into more crushing hammers. One hits heads. Wow. He's starting to deplete this board already. And I'm not sure if you knew this, uh, Joe, but uh, drawing eight cards per turn is a pretty good strategy <laughs> for winning games. <laughs> We're going to see a trading away of a double color strategy here. He just doesn't need it. Like He doesn't need to attack in this matchup, really. No, he <laughs> just needs to hold on to basically one of them so that he can use a Rangaroo. And that's all he needs. You can see Plumeria getting rid of that limitation Sableye and a double color energy. He also has a Rangaroo that he could opt to put on the bench unless he wants to keep that slot open for future Articuno plays. Once again, counter catcher. It's game one all over again, Joe. <laughs> He's got himself into this spot uh, without a Mac Cargo this time. That's the only thing that's different about the last game. Uh, the ditto being taken down means that Daniel doesn't have the guarantee of these cards. Yeah. Although he's drawing eight, uh, he's not always getting the outs. He's once again going to use Ultra Space, have a look through, see what's remaining, and uh, see what he needs to hold on to, because yeah. he's going to be trading a lot again next turn. He is. Again, oh, uh, it is kind of that exact counterpoint of, yeah, he's not guaranteeing anything next turn, but every turn he's drawing eight <laughs> cards. <laughs> Zach able to dodge the Articuno this time around, and uh, Daniel is going to opt to put down the Uranguru and pass it over here. Yeah, so again, not quite the ideal scenario for uh, Daniel as he didn't get rid of all of the energies on the Blacephalon, so attaching one more manually to uh, the Blacephalon like Zach did just there means that another mind blown is within the realms of possibility. 
but there's no Guzma in Zack's hand to deal with something he really would like to deal with, and he can't get this Marshadow out of the Active Easily either. Yeah, very awkward for him. He is going to commit to an Ultra Space, putting a Poi Pole straight to his hand. He does have one more open bench space if he, wa if he does want to try and get that fourth Meganadil out, um, which we've seen him do in both games now, Yeah, uh, which is pretty cool. He's also eyeing up Lily and Sophocles in his hand, so he may be just doing this for extra thinning before using one of those cards. Could certainly be the case. Although, if you're doing it for Lily, you wouldn't really want to get it to your hand because then you're drawing less with it. Just to play it down. Uh, oh, to play it down, yeah, sure. Yeah. He's eyeing up Sophocles as well. Yeah, I think that's going to be where he goes for here. Maybe we could even do a Mysterious Treasure, perhaps, discarding the Lily and then play the other Lily. No, it can be Sophocles discarding a Lily and a Treasure. Drawing himself four cards. He's already committed energy this turn to his bench, but Cephalon gets into a Guzma. So um, if he can dodge a Crushing Hammer here or there, there's already Plumeria, one Crushing Hammer in the discard pile. Um, so he's really just hoping. Another couple charging ups going on as well here. He's trying to set up his board. Daniel looking at everything that's in it. Oh, couple cu uh, crushing hammer in his prize. Oh, sorry, already played. So there's the potential to whiff, even though he's drawing, you know, nine cards minimum. Uh, so that's really got to be what Zach's hoping for here. Yeah, as he does pass it back over. Yeah, got to hope that Daniel misses there, because one crushing hammer heads will be enough as long as Daniel can also find a plumeria, which, given the nature of how the Zorok decks operate, is almost certainly going to happen. Having said that. Not much in his hand right now, actually, for Danny. He's also debating whether or not he's able to get rid of this rescue stretcher. He's going to need it to recycle Orangaroo if he wants to go infinite. So he's going to trade away a Palpad instead. And uh, he's going to continue to trade, gets rid of Professor Elm's Lecture, does draw into a Cynthia. He has uh, also got a Max Potion in the Lysander's Labs. There's the fourth trade. There's a Crushing Hammer. Crushing Hammer's there. He has dug into it. He's also got himself Rainbow Energy if he's somehow able to get his Oranguru into the active to start getting back these Crushing Hammers. Certainly, but uh, there are the heads as well, so this does force Zack to use the Guzma now. There is worth mentioning, I guess, as well, that there is no chance of a Plumeria this turn for Danny. He has not drawn into it off of his trades there. Yeah, I think he's used all of them. Um, so yeah. he may want to commit an attachment just to the Orangaroo so he could pay retreat next turn uh, out of anything. Yeah, potentially. Uh, that might be what he looks to do here as he tries to slowly get his Orangaroo into the active. But no, just a pass from him. Wow. Here is a Guzma play. Look how many energies are on this board. It's going to be another huge mind blown. It is. A huge number of charging ups too. He's going to do a Ultra Space, get that fourth Ringanadel into play. And Zach in much better shape than he was in that first game. Yeah, with a legit chance to win here. Guzma will be uh, you know, enough to bring up one of these Zoroarks and rather the amount of energy on the board will definitely be able to take a KO on a Zoroark. It's just going to come down to whether he can find that last Guzma to take the last mind blown for the win and whether he can do that additionally before Danny is able to find enough stuff to get rid of two energies on the Blacephalon. The biggest deal here is that Daniel hasn't been able to resource management back in the Crushing Hammers. He's yes. only got one remaining in his deck. So he's got to flip well on that and Plumeria to stop the chain of a mind blown. So if, uh, if Zach's able to take control here, he's got that beast energy as well, which he's eyeing up. He's going to continue to attach the basics because they're way safer, of yeah, course. Yeah, he recognizes that attaching the beast energy is way too risky. He doesn't quite know how many, how many uh, enhanced hammers Daniel might play. He, we have seen him discard a couple off trade already, but you know, chances are he plays uh, multiple of them from the way Zach's seeing it. So there's just really no need for it. There is the Guzma. Bringing up one Zorox, no matter which one. <laughs> They've all got Zoruas under them, yep. so give me that one, I guess. Yep. Here comes Blacephalon for a big mind blown. Six energies in the back. He has to get rid of five of them. Yep, that is the probably why he was considering potentially going for the beast energy instead, because he then uh -huh. would have only needed Lost Zone four. But that this is still fine because even Lost Zoning five, he can still do enough charging ups next turn to get the knockout. Yeah, it's more important to make sure he can continue to use mind blown. So uh we're going to see Daniel, three Zoroarks now, being able to still trade a good amount. He's actually got the Articuno Rainbow Energy combo. Oh, boy. Daniel yeah. looking pretty safe all over again. Yeah, that's 100% what he's going to be going for. Attaching Rainbow to even to the Oranguru just to you know, not put the damage onto the Articuno. Legendary Ascent goes into the active. The Rainbow Energy moves. Articuno back into the active. Going to guarantee these two Fire Energies. Get off that Blacephalon area. And so yeah. it's going to be down to him maybe looking at things like 
Rescue Stretcher to remain safe, uh, something like Pal Pad to again get these things back, and Crushing Hammers on top of all of that. Yeah, and so now he's going to have a five card deck instead of a two card <laughs> deck. <laughs> He'll probably dig back into that deck at some point as well. Yeah, this, this is very true. Here we go. Rescue Doing the stretcher. safety cards first. Yeah, that makes sense. He doesn't really need anything else at this point. He's got back the Plumeria and the Skullgrown, which is all he really needs to stop Zack being able to get that final KO. Tying up uh, Crushing Hammer as well. Always a good option to have available yeah. to you. The order of these three cards are also important because, of course, he doesn't have Mag Cargo. So how many trades he has to dig to find these is going to be interesting. So Ooh. he's got to have a little think about this. He does, and he's actually changed his mind. He opts to get the counter catcher back instead. If he wants to just draw all of them and finish on a resource management, that's also fine. And in that case, he doesn't have to worry too much about his, uh, his ordering. He doesn't. Now back to Zach. How does he combat this? There's the beast energy in his hand, but <sighs> he's got to be, feel pretty uncomfortable attaching that. Uncomfortable for sure. Uh, he's just down to two prize cards remaining, but you wouldn't think it here. Um, he's in a really bad spot. Will he ever be able to get an attack off again this game? If he was able to switch the Marshadow into the one of the Naganadal without needing a Guzma, then with the Beast Energy in his hand, he could actually take a KO on the Oranguru, and that yeah. would be a really good win condition for him. Yeah, but that Rainbow Energy. Putting him in range. Yeah, but sadly, Guzma is the only switch card that's available, and with that, he has to pick one of Daniel's bench to bring to the active instead. And we're going to see, looking through his hand, looking through his deck, it looks like, or his discard pile, um, he's going to... Oh, he's going to Ultra Space Ablocephalon out. Maybe uh, not. Oh, no, that's his I'm hand. I'm pretty sure that's the yeah. Ultra Space. Yeah, he's shuffling his deck now. And uh, let's see what else he can come up with this turn. How many cards can he draw? Will he commit this beast energy this turn? He does. He does he have a choice? The thing, yeah, exactly. If you don't do manual attachment pressure, it just means that Daniel can get more of those luxury cards back to put himself in an even better spot. It doesn't look good no matter which way you arrange it. And yeah, there goes the beast energy onto the Blacephalon, but we all know that's almost certainly not going to stay around. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, it's kind of the same as a special energy here because both the enhanced hammers aren't in Daniel's deck. Yeah. Uh, so I guess he just has to begrudgingly go for it. Daniel drawing into that Gladian, he's going to quickly uh, look at three Pokemon that he can get back in to recycle with the rescue stretcher that he's inevitably able to draw into with his deck size so thin. And actually maybe thinking about going for the Cynthia or... No, he goes Just to, to trade these away, yeah. Yeah, Gladian draws two, gets counter catch a double colorless. Gonna have to Plumeria this turn unless he wants to dig a little deeper and try and find that crushing hammer all over again. Nope, there it is, Plumeria discarding Oranguru and Cynthia. There now goes that the he's got rid of the Oranguru, he needs to put the rescue stretcher back in with this uh, resource management and immediately yeah. you know that that's what he's doing. Yeah, so Rescue Stretcher gets, shuffles the Iron Guru back in and again that is his deck. <laughs> yeah, once again uh, shuffling those in and just so much control. You know exactly what you're drawing into. You're putting the exact cards back into your deck. It's so deadly this combination. Just cannot, cannot fault it really. There is resource management once again. Plumeria goes back in as is Rescue Stretcher. Is there any way Zach can actually deal with this? I, I'm just trying to think through the options that he has, but as long as he can only attach one energy manually per turn, I don't think he can pull this out, you know? Honestly, I think he is trapped. It's a really awkward state of affairs. Daniel's got the perfect lock on him. And then this is why we saw a lot of the other Blacephon on this opting to play things like Energy Switch, because they can avoid these, exactly these sorts of situations, you know? You can with energy switch, get the Blacephalon going in one turn. You don't have to wait to manually attach twice. And uh, Zach trying to refresh his hand, trying to see if there's anything else he can do here where his one retreat Marsh Shadow is in the active and his two energy attacking Blacephalon is on the bench with nothing on it. He's running out of energy, plenty of those in the top of your screen there in the loss zone already with the mind blowns that he has been able to pull off. But it's just you know, taking a lot of out a lot of resources out of him. This Articuno completely flipping the game. Indeed. Drawing six. Finds a fire energy that's gonna go onto 
the Persephalon, but we know that Danny's just going to use all his trades, draw the Plumeria, <laughs> and do resource management. There's, as long as Danny doesn't forget to Plumeria, it, there's just no way he loses. Yeah, it's just, unfortunately, the inevitability, because yeah. he knows exactly what he's drawing into. First trade, second trade, get rid of those Magcargo pieces that I've just put back into my deck. I'll put those back in later. Let me use this Plumeria real quick, get rid of the energy uh, that, I, that you've just attached this turn. I'm gonna resource. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna use the uh, rescue stretcher to get those three exact cards that I just discarded back into my deck, and uh, I'm gonna be able to once again trade through if I want to anymore and resource management those cards that I just used this turn. Yeah. No. There's there's no way at this point. Eventually, Zach can keep up this uh, charade for as long as he wants, but eventually he just runs out of energy and then he loses regardless. I really just cannot see a win condition for Zach here. Daniel putting back the Crushing Hammer over the um, Team Skullgrunt. Not going to make a huge amount of difference, as we said. He can just do the plume area every single turn, and there's that simple inevitability that he's going to win this game. Yeah, and I mean, obviously there's no point conceding here. You know, maybe Danny does make a mistake, and that ends up working out in Zach's over there so that he does win. He, he stands, he loses nothing by playing this out. Yeah. But it's just it's kind of hard to not see the writing on the wall. He's going to have another look through his deck with that Ultra Space, shuffling it up all over again. It's looking a little bit thin now, so it is getting into these awkward stages where there's not much else he can do. No energies in his hand either from this turn on. So uh, as we see, he's already got Plumeria in his hand before doing any of these trade shenanigans. Um, so he really has got uh, Zach in bad shape here. Yeah, there's... Ultra Ball, Choice Helmet, Beast Ring, <laughs> Mysterious Treasure, none of these cards help him. Daniel, Plumeria on those Pokemon that he keeps getting back with Rescue Stretcher. And uh, he's once again going to play that Rescue Stretcher, get the same three back, and he can resource management back the Palpat, the Plumeria, and the Crushing Hammer, or whatever else he wants to essentially replay the cards that he played this turn. Yeah, and again, Stretcher, resource management. We can, we, can, we, can, we can stay here all evening, folks. I mean, it's not going to change the outcome. Yeah, he's continuing to trade one more time. Uh, it means that he's still, you know, in trading distance for the rest of his deck for whatever he needs. So he's going to get himself that rescue stretcher, that plume area, potentially the power pad. He's actually just going to go for the counter catcher. That's also fine. Yeah. And send it back to Zach here. Looking in bad shape. No energy in his hand. Just load of ball search cards, no draw either, just a pass. And now is when Daniel can get some more luxury pieces back and do even more work here. Yeah, not even a fire energy this time for, for Zach, the poor guy. <laughs> just not able to catch a single break with Danny. Just because of the way he set up his deck, not missing a beat, not even just due to luck not missing a beat. He's set this up very intentionally. Yeah, and Daniel uh, looking through like, oh, you didn't actually attach energy this turn. Well, my plan was to just to use Plumeria again. Uh, I guess I'm in uh, even better shape than I thought. <laughs> um, he can just get back some more options now. Uh, we're going to see the rescue stretcher lined up from Danny, getting back the limitation Sableye this time, as well as a couple of those Macargo pieces. And maybe this turn, he's going to grab himself that pal pad, and uh, as well as the rescue stretcher all over again, keeping him in that loop so that he can't deck out. And maybe there's another piece that he needs along the way. Um, could get himself just another crushing hammer for an extra buffer. Gonna get himself Gladion, maybe. Uh, he has the pal pad anyway, though, if he wants to do that. So it's just one of those luxury spots where you almost don't want to put an extra card into your deck because his deck's already perfect and you want to keep it actually quite thin yeah, so absolutely. that you can guarantee it. But, you know, it's it's um, a first world problem for him. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Just likes to get back to Lysander's Labs. Why not just counter the Ultra Space? Yeah, and it's an insta-playable card, so it's essentially like you've not drawn one. Yeah, uh, eventually. <sighs> Zach draws a fire energy for his turn. And Just passes this time, trying to get a little bit creative and crafty. He knows that uh, Daniel did put back the um, pal pad, and you've got to think he's going to try and do a skull grunt this turn. There's a there's a limitation. So limitation save like being discarded for Zorak for trade. He's got uh, no more trades available to him, so he actually can't use any supporter this turn. Well, he could use a Plumeria, but there's actually no reason at all to use it. So no. we're just going to see the Rescue Stretcher again, recycling. Uh, actually, it's just a resource management here. Yeah, Game back Skullgrunt and Gladian 
and limitation Sableye. No, double colorless maybe. Double colorless. Does it does it even does it even matter at this point? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think <laughs> your hand is just going to continue to accumulate. The only way that Zach could shuffle uh, Daniel's hand is the Marshall that's stuck in the active position. So yeah. if he puts the limitation Sableye to the top, he can just easily trade that away, access the other two that are in the bottom three cards of his deck. You've seen he's just drawn that Sableye. Here come the last two cards. Here comes Gladian for the luxury supporter. Let's see what he can pull out here. Just give himself even more options to play around with. He's eyeing up a Acerola here. So you just pick up the Articuno. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why he's not? He's going to put himself in that spot where he's just being even more safe. He saw the turns where uh, Zach wasn't attaching any, any energy cards and he didn't have a single supporter to play. So he's like, oh, I can just get a free Acerola in here. Why not? Yeah. And I guess in theory, although most players tend to know the list by this point, the, you know, the tournament is so big that maybe Danny just didn't have a chance to look. And, you know, it could be that he doesn't know that Zach doesn't play Energy Switch, for example. And he might just be thinking, oh, maybe Zach is just biding his time, waiting to draw to the Energy Switch manually to just uh, do the whole playing one turn and then win from there. Daniel here continuing to accumulate the best cards in his discard pile with this resource management. Again, putting that save light to the top. That's his favorite tradable card, just for the style points of showing that, yeah, that's a card he plays in his deck. Yeah, for sure. And interesting, Zach hasn't just passed straight away this time. He's drawn a second fire energy. He's going for a charging up. This is trying interesting. To, trying to make a play here, paying retreat of the Marshadow, actually going for a turning point attack. It's been a long time since he's pulled one of these off. He's going to try and uh, put Daniel in an awkward spot here in any way that he can. But of course, he has the max potion ready to go and another energy. Well, he tried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the counter catcher. <laughs> the counter catcher, uh, Oranguru, uh, replaying that energy. Also, going to see Daniel um, resource management back those cards. Got, I think it's got to be the max potion, the energy, and one other card. Oh boy. <laughs> He's saying, yeah, Zach, you can you can do that as much as you want, but. I just can recycle those answers every yeah. single turn. Yep. Yeah. Zach goes to the Ultra Space just to see what's even left in his deck. So there's a Blacephalon you can grab. Doesn't does he Two want to? Two energy cards and a Guzma. I think that's uh, that's the extent of the situation at this point. He's going to yeah. get a Blacephalon out. His deck is really running thin, and uh, as you know, a win condition is to simply run the opponent out of deck cards, and that's pretty much what Daniel's doing here in the second game. As um. Daniel put a double colorless back with the resource management, didn't he? I'm pretty sure he must have. Yeah. I think he's in that loop where he just pretty much plays those cards and then resource management's those yeah. exact cards back. Even if he doesn't, he's holding one in hand. Oh, okay, yeah. So And he has a Sorota available if he needs to. I was thinking maybe some fringe win condition could be Guzma up the Articuno, just attack it twice with turning point. But then obviously if he's got double colors to retreat the Articuno, then that's not viable. Attacking twice is never viable against no, this because they can always just a Sorota up anyway. Exactly. So. It's just inherently something that you can't accomplish. There's Plumeria back again. He's it's also going to get rid of a crushing hammer. Just doesn't need it at this point. Why take a 50-50 when you can have it guaranteed? Once again, using that rescue stretcher to recycle his deck if he needs to. He's also just... Actually, he doesn't even need to. He can just finish on a, a resource management here. Yeah. Again, getting back the cards that he just played. He is going to play that Rescue Stretcher, showing off the um, three Pokemon that he'll just pretty much trade away yep. before using resource management to get back into those three better cards. Zach draws, fi finally, finally finds the Guzma. F what about, you know, 1,000 turns too late? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I mean, sure, you can play it. It's yeah. Go for Articuno. It's like I was saying, that, that is literally the only out maybe... Maybe there's a one in a million chance that Danny doesn't have a way to retreat the Articuno. I mean, he's not seen an Acerola from Daniel yet. He gladdened it back from the prize card, so he's trying to play the outs, but Daniel, you know, one step ahead already yep. has... Um, then yeah, that's there it. you go. Zach had to see the Acerola to believe it, um, but obviously Daniel had every single card available to him to close out that game. And Very convincing stuff. Yes, Danny, Daniel Atavila takes the game, takes the series, and will be advancing to the top four. Phenomenal play from him. Uh, just using even a one retreat cost Pokemon <laughs> as a shield to deny uh, Zach getting any attacks off for the majority of the game. Such creative play, using counter catcher very effectively, 
using all of those Blue Marys and Crushing Hammers, looping his deck to perfection uh, to close out both games. Yeah, just a really, really phenomenal stuff. And commiserations to Zat Lassage. You've got a feel for him, obviously, having come all this way, finally being able to make a you know, another top eight after having, you know, such amazing results uh, over the, you know, in 2013, 2008, and uh, after having mainly more top 16s and top 32s in uh, 2018, but you still got to be happy with a top eight finish. Yeah, absolutely chuffed with that. It's a great performance from him. And it's not only a win for Daniel Altavir, it's a win for the Articuno GX. Yeah, yes, it, it is. It came in and swept a Blacephalon of all of its energy in games one and two, and that's what completely secured the game really, really great tech card, and it paid dividends against this matchup. Yeah, because, uh, it, again, it's really mainly in here for that and Buzzwall. You know, these are uh, attackers that, you know, without B-String being online, really struggle to get to their, actually, attack costs being fulfilled. Yeah, and uh, that's really just the way to go about this matchup. Never get intimidated by one big attacker that can wipe your board because you have that Articuno GX option available to you. There were some sticky situations. The let looses were kind, and that's why we saw Daniel take the win. Yeah, absolutely. Now, is there some kind of discussion going on over the over the over the match? I it's mean, like I can't really see what's going on here. No, there, there, there might be just be chatting about what happened. Yeah, I guess. possibly. No, yeah. Just, as I mentioned before, there's two guys. The two guys know each other. They're just going to be, you know, discussing it. And yeah, you see that the shrug from Zach, just like, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, you pretty much had that in the bag throughout the whole thing. He's and smiling. Yeah. He's happy about his top eight finish, and he knows that it was an awkward matchup. We spoke to him earlier. He said, "Oh man, that Azorok control going to be a hard matchup from the offset." And Daniel, you know, did what he needed to do. Yeah, yeah, he he did. He just never really, never really making a single mistake really throughout this whole time. And as soon as he had a little bit of luck, of luck in the beginning to draw decently off of the let looses, setting up his entire board and just really taking control of the game from there, as the name of the deck might imply. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to